Hi, so I'm here talking to Lisa McCorkle, and um, Lisa is with the patient-led whatever, but she can explain the exact affiliation. I'm not always great with that. And so um, she and, and a colleague just had a, a commentary out in uh, Nature or one of the Nature publications uh, about kind of what they feel is necessary with long COVID now. So I just wanted to talk to Lisa about what her perspective was on that and so on. So Lisa, why don't you give us your exact title and uh, uh, you know a better introduction to yourself and then explain what the point of the, or the goal of this comment was. Sure, thank you, David. Um, so my name is Lisa McCorkle. I'm one of the co-founders and co-leads of the Patient-Led Research Collaborative. And we are a group of people with long COVID and associated conditions that study the condition. Um, we have funded research into long COVID. Um, we do advocacy for people with long COVID and broader um, within the disability community. Um, we've been around since April of 2020. I've been sick with long COVID since March of 2020 with a mild case. Um, and my background is in public policy. And um, yeah, that's kind of a basic well, summary. Also, I graduated from uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, as did I. Yes, yes. Um, have my master's in public policy from UC Berkeley. Um, and went to undergrad at UCLA, um, so California public institution <laughs> person. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, so for this comment, um, there was um, a few different things that we wanted to do with this. So this was co-authored with Dr. Michael Peluso, who is at UCSF. Um, and in the article, um, one of the main points we get across is that we need a moonshot for long COVID. Um, we really need a sustained and large investment into long COVID research. Um, so we say at least $1 billion a year, every year for the next 10 years. Um, this is, you know, I, I think we can easily justify um, having more, but at this point where we're at, there is no line item for long COVID research in the NIH budget for next year. Um, it's not looking promising for future years. And we really wanted to demonstrate how not having funding is going to be um, disastrous for the field overall um, when we've made so much progress in the last three and a half years. Um, another you know, point of the article was really showing we have had a lot of progress. This is one of, um, you know, this is, we, there's like three to four articles coming out every day on long COVID. There's so much progress that we've made, but we're still not at the level of, you know, having a treatment that's FDA approved. We and have people, very few clinical say, trials. Well, people might say that, you know, the government already allocated this 1.15 billion, what's happened with that and so on as well. I mean, that could be pushback that people might make. Yeah, and I think what we're trying to, to say moving forward is that it wasn't enough. $1.15 billion is not enough to solve any illness. It's not enough ever. Like that's just, it's kind of peanuts compared to what we need. And so our point was we need that level of investment, but every year at least um, in order to solve this this problem, um, and especially given how many people are impacted, how severe the condition can be, how much um, toll it takes personally and economically, um, you know, we really need a massive level of investment on the order of billions, not on the order of millions. Um, so, you know, it's not, we didn't do a proper analysis on, you know, what exactly would be needed to solve this problem. We just wanted to say, this is a problem that deser is deserving of billions of dollars a year in NIH research funding. Mm -hmm. And we need to start having those conversations because right now Congress is allocating zero to us. 
Right, uh, so I mean, to, to some degree, I mean, th th it, it's not that we're specifically calling for that much. It's more, it, to some degree, that would be great, but you really want to call attention to the magnitude of the problem, and you're just kind of picking that number out because it sounds like a really good number, and it would be a very effective number to have. Yeah, I mean, if we can get $3 billion, that would be amazing. If we can get more, like, I'm always going to be for more. Um, that's why we said at least $1 billion, but it was more showing, you know, we got that initial $1 billion for the Recover Initiative. That was to cover four years. We need that level, at least that level of investment every year in order to make meaningful progress and to really build on the momentum we have so far. And so what are the steps? I mean, you, you sort of outlined some things that you say are prior, prior, priorities. It does seem one of the ones especially was sort of uh, the idea of having some kinds of biomarkers. I mean, again, not one for everybody, but specific aspects, uh, biomarkers that could be actually actionable in terms of, you know, uh, employment and insurance and all those kinds of things and, and just indicating what kind of treatment might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to calling for the funding, like sustained and immense amount of funding, we laid out six different priorities um, that we feel long COVID research should really focus on. So one is agreeing on what long COVID is, coming up with definitions. That's for like research definition, um, but also for clinical care um, and really having the those be as expansive and inclusive as possible and recognizing that there may be different definitions for different purposes. And why don't you just explain for a second why, why it's important sometimes to have different definitions, maybe more expansive definitions for clinical definitions and more narrow ones for research definitions. Yeah, so for clinical care, the most important thing is to not deny someone care because they don't meet like a very strict research definition criteria. Um, and so we want to make sure that people are able to receive care if they're experiencing symptoms that are, um, if they're basically just if they're experiencing long COVID. Right. Um, for research purposes, you know, I know that there's, um, I, I personally also want that to be as inclusive as possible because I think it's study, it's important to be inclusive of all types of phenotypes of long COVID when you're studying. Um, I think there are different aspects of, um, long COVID research that make it difficult when you have a very expansive definition, it's difficult to identify exactly, you know, the, the different samples that are, um, or the factors that are influencing the, 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 uh, the outcome. Right. Right. Yeah. And I'm probably not, um, being great with my words here, um, but that's, you know, normal with brain fog. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's just, you know, it can be, um, the, the really important thing I do want to get across though, is in any research definition um, that's being created, validating it in other samples outside of whatever, you know, it, it was created in mm -hmm. um, and really trying to be, you know, as inclusive as possible. Okay. Uh, but so that is one is, you know, trying to figure out what definition and we say, you know, even if there there's different efforts to creating these, this definition to refining a definition, um, but at the very minimum, having researchers getting used to saying what the definition they used is so that we can at least compare across different studies. That's another reason to have, um, you know, coordinated definitions. Uh, because right now, you know, different studies are using different definitions, but aren't necessarily like very clear about about what they're doing. Right. And even if they are, the definitions can be, I mean, again, the definitions can be more expansive or more narrow and you get possibly different outcomes for, you know, what what whatever it is based on how you define the population in the first place. So, you know, that, as you say, was refer your first point. Right, right. So, you know, that's a priority. Um, another is bolstering team science, really trying to bring together people who are normally not necessarily used to working together from different fields and making it a bit easier for um, these folks to work together. Um, since long COVID is so multi-systemic, um, we really need kind of every discipline involved in long COVID research. 
Um, and historically, there's been silos. And, and even the way that NIH is set up currently, it's very based off of your certain discipline. Um, and so long COVID doesn't fit neatly into any specific institute right now. Um, and so that's also why we call for an office for infection-associated chronic condition research. Um, ideally, even we'd have a, an institute dedicated to these conditions. Um, but, you know, at minimum, having an office that can help coordinate research for these conditions across the different institutes that it has, um, that there's research happening in. So that would be, you know, NINDS and NHLBI, NIAID. I uh, want to make sure that there's overlap and that those teams are talking to each other and that this office could really have um, help set a research agenda that is um you know, really looking at these conditions in a lens that is prioritizing what patients want to be studied mm -hmm. um, and really looking at it from a multidisciplinary lens. Um, so that's, you know, another one. And then, like you mentioned, accelerating biomarker discovery is, is a third one that we prioritize um, with the caveat that biomarkers aren't necessary to uh, move forward with clinical trials. We are very passionate about um, making like making sure folks understand that you can use patient reported outcomes as endpoints for clinical trials, but that having those biomarkers are going to be really important for potential diagnoses, for clinical care, for disability benefits. Um, and that's why um, you know, it kind of feeds into that importance of a definition and making sure that that's as inclusive as possible would be um, finding biomarkers that are um, in as many patients as possible and recognizing that, you know, there might be different biomarkers mm -hmm. um, and not, there may not be just like one that works for everyone with long COVID. Well, I suppose it could be symptom. I mean, there's symptom biomarkers perhaps or biomarkers for specific categories of symptoms in some way as opposed to sort mm -hmm. of the cluster is probably somewhat different for it, you know, so varies among people so much. Yeah, that's true. And I think what's, what's important is like the communication around something like that, where it would be, you know, not everyone with long COVID has this one symptom, for example. Um, you know, I think that was one of the, um, the unfortunate repercussions of the JAMA paper that was based off of the um, recover study that came up with the 12 symptoms um, that I was a co-author on. And, you know, I had worked really hard in drafting the article to make it be a helpful piece, but unfortunately in the lead up to the publication, which was very quick, the title of the article was changed and the press release and subsequent media kind of reinterpreted. Um, what the study was about and made it seem like those 12 symptoms are who has long COVID and that's not what the intention was. And so, you know, really being careful about um, when communicating about anything related to biomarkers or to, you know, having a symptom-based, um, you know, potential definition or biomarker, of, like what that actually means and that that's not necessarily, um, you know, you have to have that in order to say you have long COVID. It, it, do you think there's any realistic prospect um, for a, a you know a center or an institute even uh, on sort of post-infectious complex uh, illness? Because it does seem to be you know as, as you know as as the name implies, it's obviously a much broader kind of swath. Or not, I mean, it's not a broader swath. And long COVID is obviously so huge, but there's a, a broader sort of swath of conditions that would fall under that umbrella. Uh, clearly, and a lot more people that would be impacted by that if those things are sort of viewed systemically from this point on. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I, I think we're trying to push for um, the phrasing infection associated chronic condition. And in terms of a center or institute, I'm hopeful that that would be um possible. I think for, it, you know, it, it seems like it might be a little more politically feasible to have an office first, um, yeah. but we're, you know, we'll try to push for, for a center or institute, which may be more realistic a few years down the line. 
Yeah, I'm, right. Excuse me. It should be with post-acute infection, shouldn't it be? Or po what's the phrasing now? Post-acute infection syndrome. Yeah, we're saying infection-associated infection um, chronic condition. Yeah, to be um, inclusive. Okay. Um, any last things you want to say about what you had to say? Um, yeah, I will say, you know, I, this article was really focused on research um, and in order to really um, solve the problems that we're facing and to help patients with long COVID, there's much more that we need. We need better medical education. We need better public education and awareness. We need to ensure people's basic needs are met um, by expanding the social safety net. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, this was largely focused on, you know, just the research side of things, but this is a problem that we need to, um, really be putting a significantly much, like much more investment in than what Congress has been putting in so far. Um, and, you know, budget's a reflection of one's values. And right now it seems clear that Congress doesn't value people with, long COVID and definitely doesn't value disabled people broadly. Um, and so just acknowledging that, you know, research is a piece of the puzzle. It's a big piece. We also need um, to address medical education to get the public um, aware of what long COVID is and, um, well, and really make sure we're taking care of people once they are sick before we have treatments available. What are you seeing in, in the sense of, um, you know, because the, con the conversation started obviously right after COVID, right after the epidemic started. Um, are you still seeing the same numbers of people, uh, you know, in sort of, the, the, you know, whatever current wave we're having or from previous waves after the wave in which earlier people got infected? Is, is Are you seeing the problem the same, similar, differing? Is there any sense of that at this point? In terms of like percentage of people who develop long COVID, that and 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 the severity, or you know, are are you seeing the same numbers of people? Because it was sort of a wave of reporting all at once, and now, you know, we hear we hear about it, but it sort of seems to be more people who were infected, at least that we read about, or that you know seem to be reported on people who were infected in the earlier days, not people who were sort of just infected last year and and so on. So I'm sort of wondering what you're seeing sort of being from the inside there. Yeah, so if I'm, um, the JAMA paper actually had um, good data on this, which I um, can never remember exact numbers, um, but the Omicron period had higher rates of long COVID than previous, um, than like waves. right before Omicron, like Delta wave, for example, um, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, but we still see, you know, the the numbers are not going down by any means. Right. Um, you know, we're still seeing a steady stream and at least within the patient community, um, unfortunately, like we're we're seeing our numbers grow. We're seeing That's what I was um, that about. reflected in the the numbers. But the yeah, the household poll survey data has been fairly um um, you know, fairly consistent. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I think that's kind of a, a misconception that uh, numbers are going down and probably is related to, like you said, kind of media coverage and, um, and who is platformed um, and like which voices are heard. And to what extent do you, do you, do you get, are people still, and it might be different in the UK than in the US, are people still, um uh receiving uh, uh especially from their primary care doctor sort of the psychogenic response or it's ang just it's anxiety or depression uh i'm sure there must be a lot of reports of that still but do you see it as often or do you see at least some more awareness among the patients so that you're sort of in touch with I think there is more awareness among primary care providers, at least in the U.S. I think it's still a huge issue in the U.K. and and um, outside of the U.S. and other countries. It seems like it's still a huge issue. Um, I, but we still see it happening. And even if you know a provider doesn't necessarily like 
right out dismiss your symptoms, um, most healthcare providers that are, you know, general practitioners or um, regardless in the U.S. are not necessarily clear on how to treat or even what tests to order. So even if they're not dismissing, they're not necessarily also like providing yeah. high quality yeah. care. Um, so we just have, we still have so much medical education to, to provide. Okay. Um, well, good. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, hold on a second. Let me stop the recording.